Hello everyone and welcome back. My name is Sam. And I'm Melissa. I grew up in the FLDS community. It is a polygamous group run by Warren Jeffs, which I moved out of when I was 18 years old. I was raised LDS. Sam and I have been married for eight years and have two beautiful babies together. Yes, we do. And we are very excited to be back here with you and to welcome on a very special guest, Mike King. He is from the YouTube video Profiling Evil. Very interesting YouTube channel. Yes, and podcast. Yes. He also has a couple books out, um, Deceived, all about the Zion Society, and She Knew No Fear. And so we will put both of those books linked. He has written many other books. Has done amazing work in so many things that I can't even list them all, but we are just so excited to have him and hear some of the stories about his dealings with the FLDS community. So thank you so much, Mike, for being here. Oh, holy cow. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I mean, I, I think back it was months ago, uh, probably eight months ago, when I first reached out to the two of you to get a little insight, uh, knowing that Sam was one of those hooligans that were running around town while I was <laughs> trying to arrest uh, Warren Jeffs. Yeah, probably throwing rocks at your cars. And... You, ne you never caught me, did you? <laughs> no. In fact, Sam, one, one of the funniest things I remember is I took my family one day uh, into the community, uh, we we were down and uh, driving around, and of course, there's always a cadre of vehicles that would follow you back in those days, led by Willie Jessup's band of uh, men, yeah. and uh, we uh, made our way over to the far east side of town where the elk pens were and where the animals and and uh, I think some of the additional stuff that that used to be in the zoo. Yep. And uh, we were pulled up alongside the fence, and, and uh, as uh, we were standing there, a carload of kids that were probably in their uh, 14 to 16-year-old age range came by, and uh, they uh, flipped us off. So, oh. <laughs> Just getting a nice warm welcome, welcome to the community. To the community. That's right. That's right. <laughs> welcome to Hilldale. Oh, oh my word. word. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's funny and also very surprising. Uh, we were taught that that was a, a bad thing to do, but I guess, I guess that's how they felt about you in that moment. The, <laughs> that you know, I'm not sure what prompted it because I, I know I would always go down there on a regular basis uh, under the authority of the attorney general and I'd stop in the store and I'd try to communicate and I'd stop and talk to people. And of course, uh, we're going to talk all about those kinds of things, but uh, the reception was always very cold and uh, it was always very interesting to be in the community. Wow. Yeah. Well, we can't wait to get into this and then see <clears throat> kind of what your experience was like. And I can share some of my uh, thoughts on maybe why your experience was that way. Um, but but let's kind of start at the beginning. What is it that, uh, well, first of all, could you t uh, tell our viewers a little bit about what it, what your YouTube channel is about? The oh, thanks. Evil? Yeah. Pro profiling evil. We actually, I, it, during the original days of COVID, I think my children over the course of my uh, lifetime have gotten so tired of hearing old cop stories that they suggested that maybe I ought to just get on uh, YouTube one night and yammer for a minute and talk about <laughs> some case that I handled. And uh, I'll be darned, we, we uh, got on and it somehow resonated with people. We've now grown to 130,000 subscribers and, wow. and uh, we're breaking the 10 uh, million view mark. And it's wow. just uh, been an amazing experience. But what, you, what Profiling Evil is meant to do, there's a lot of true crime channels out there and a lot of people who are speculating with no understanding of the investigative process. And uh, a lot of times the opinions expressed are uh, really opinionated and really off track. And so what I try to do is spend a little more time talking about the criminal investigative process and helping people to understand a little more of what the pros and cons are to many of the things that they're jumping to conclusions on in hopes, because I believe people are really intelligent, that they'll look at these things a little differently and maybe a little more patiently as they wait for criminal cases to unfold. So that's kind of what we're all about is training, uh, educating and entertaining a little bit. That's right. awesome. Yeah. It's so easy. Um, 
out, outsiders or if you don't have any idea of the process that it takes. It's very easy to pass judgment. And we even see that, you know, when even just talking about the FLDS, you know, just bringing attention can help bring a lot of compassion along with awareness. It's much easier to <clears throat> have compassion for those communities, for the law enforcement, for everybody when you have that side of the story. So and for those of us that, that really feel there are some people in danger, like yourself and, and us now, uh, yes, sharing this information or, or trying to confront certain people may cause a lot of enemies, but uh, we do it for the few people that it will help, right? You know, you're exactly right. And you think about your own experience, Sam. <clears throat> it takes an incredible amount of confidence to, after you have consumed, drank the Kool-Aid, consumed in the ideology to discover that there are pieces and parts of it that are broken and really destructive. And uh, it's a real unique individual that can say, I'm going to change the swim lane I'm in and go a different direction because I now understand how wrong I was. And, and we, you know, I, we saw it early on when I was investigating Cases like uh, daycare providers who uh, hurt and or, or injured children in uh, the daycare that they were in charge of. Parents who would go to the defense of that daycare provider because if they didn't, it meant that they put their child in harm's way. And that was just too big of a step for those parents to take. And, and we see the same thing, especially when it comes to cult behaviors. And, uh, and cult is not a negative term. There are destructive cults and there are cults that are not destructive. But uh, we, we have that same thing as people come to understand the destructive nature of a cult. If they've invested their whole life, brought their children like your mom and dad into it, uh, or, or have invested everything they have financially, man, that is a big challenge to say I was wrong and I put a whole bunch of people at risk. Yes. Well, and we've talked before about Sam's father, you know, at this point, he's 84 years old. And as much as you in your heart were like, oh, we would hope that his parents would leave at 84 years old when your entire life's been invested and your wives are still out there. Even if you did stop leaving, what good would come from like leaving your family? You know, not what good would come, but yeah, there's a whole so other it's element. It's hard to point. switch at yeah. that point when you're so deep and so invested <laughs> in your entire life and your entire family is still in it. I can't even imagine if that would even be a possibility at this point. Even if he did stop believing it, would you <laughs> back out at that point? Yeah, yeah a, absolutely. And, and you know, I, I knew your dad. Uh, of course, I don't know him today, but I knew him back then. It was always an adversarial role whenever I came to Dodge. And, uh, <laughs> but... Uh, again, imagine for them, your folks, as they come to the realities of some of the things that Warren did, for instance, or if they're even questioning the belief system, how hard that would be knowing that you brought in, I can't even remember, uh, Sam, 30 siblings or something, is that? Yeah. 35, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Imagine, imagine how you two feel about those two little tykes running around your house if you let them astray in some way. Imagine that times thirty-five. Yeah, yeah, I can't, can't even imagine. It's uh, it's it's tough, and and I was uh, one of the, I guess you could say, lucky ones that that got out at a younger age, at eighteen. But some of these men and women, I mean, they span their whole adult lives. I mean, up up into the 60s and 70s and 80s uh, in, in this and believing and teaching people about this. And at that point, even if they find out that something is wrong, to accept that they had been wrong their entire life or, you know, a good part of their life, it's just, I, I can't imagine how difficult that would be for them. Yeah. 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 And real quick, I do want to do a shout out. Um, starting on Thanksgiving, we are going to be doing a fundraiser. You'll be able to see the donation button below for holding out um, help. And that's an organization that when people do leave polygamous groups, they can go there. So no matter what age, if you are leaving or if you're watching this and you're in transition of leaving an FLDS or any 
um, polygamous community, you can reach out to them and they help people be able to gain education, have support to be able to find jobs and those type of things. So that is our Christmas cause. <laughs> so anybody's interested in donating to that cause, there will be links below on this video. Yes. And thank you all in advance. Well, well you know what? I got, I got to just say, I, I'll be one of those donating uh, f folks. Think about <clears throat> how difficult it would be at a young age, especially your teenage years, to go and step out and get a place to live and try to trust a community that you'd spent your whole life being told was evil and was your pathway to hell. And uh, uh, anything that can be done to help, I just applaud you too. And thanks for doing it because there's a lot of folks who stay because they don't know how to leave. Yes, yeah. very, very true, especially the women, especially or those that don't have family members already out. Very, very challenging. So, yeah. So, thank you. And uh, I guess my first question for you, Mike, well, I mean, other than a little bit about your podcast, is um, what were your career positions that initially got you involved with the FLDS community? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of an old guy now. And uh, back in, in uh, 1979, I started as a police officer. And uh, by uh, the, the mid 80s, I had accepted a job in the county attorney's office as an investigator. Uh, I, I was working up in the Ogden area. So it was the Weber County Attorney's Office. And one particular day, I walked into the office. I was I was living the police officer's dream. I was running an undercover uh, sting task force that was buying stolen cars, and we were working our way up the chain into chop shops and other kinds of things. Wow! And I, I walked into the county attorney's office, and the uh, receptionist there said, hey, I need you to talk to this woman who's been waiting for an hour for an investigator. So I was, I was the last person they wanted to choose to do this. But they said, can you just talk to her for a moment, find out what she's got, and then we'll refer, refer it over to some of the other investigators in the office. So I approached her and, and just a beautiful 23-year-old woman, she stood and uh, very confidently shook my hand and she said, I'm involved in a cult that's sexually abusing children. Do you have a minute to talk to me? <laughs> and, you know, you think about how just that statement that I just made impacts you. Uh, oh, I'm trying to act like I hear this every single day, uh, but that launched me into an investigation that, that is what the book Deceived is about. And I do want to mention if people buy that book Deceived, I don't get any of the proceeds. We're using all the money from Deceived to actually build a new children's advocacy center, a place where children can go and get medical and and uh, forensic investigative support. They can be prepared for court. They can get uh, put into foster care and all kinds of things. Oh, but uh, wow. this case ended up uh, consuming the next three years of my life. And we ultimately were able to, with 70 police officers, raid this compound and uh, take 32 children and get them into protective custody. Eventually, uh, 12 individuals were convicted of serious sexual crimes against children. In fact, um, on the Dr. Phil show, I met the children 30 years after this event. First time I'd met them since they were little kids. <clears throat> and it was a very emotional moment for me. And I, I said to Dr. Phil... Uh, I said, you know, these children endured more than 4,000 rapes during their lifetime. And, uh, and the girls stepped up on the show and said, double it. And, uh, and so to give you a feel of how um, horrendous that was, well, that kind of propelled me into the cult world. And I was sent and uh, started uh, some connections with the FBI, was ultimately trained as a criminal profiler and started looking at serial predators, primarily uh, in cult settings. It, it was about that time in the early 90s, if it, you wouldn't remember this, but if you looked it up historically, there was a period that was kind of affectionately called the Satanic Panic Era, and everybody believed that Satan was involved in every abuse that happened. Mm. Well, the Utah legislature took it serious enough that they actually committed a huge amount of money 
and put together a task force to go out and look at all allegations of ritualistic abuse. And, uh, and so I ended up leading that group. And for a wow. number of years, uh, that took me to every polygamous community in the state of Utah, as well as those closed societies. And I want to kind of separate them because um, it wasn't an assault on polygamy. It was an assault on the closed society and that mentality that occurs in those. Uh, and that eventually uh, had me down in, in Colorado City, Hilldale on a regular basis. Wow. Oof. Oh, my goodness. I'm lying to you. Were, <laughs> you were right in the middle of all of this, then, it sounds like. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and yes, I you. was. Oof. And of course, we'll, we'll kind of focus on the FLDS because that's uh, where I'm from. But uh, you say that you went to all, all, or at least a lot of the polygamous groups. Now, that's a lot, isn't it, in Utah? Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, the, the largest concentration of uh, groups living a plural lifestyle are in the, the Utah area, as, as many people know. And folks, don't get wrapped around the axles about whether this was an LDS church thing or a polygamous thing. Polygamy started and was banned back in the 1800s, the late 1800s, the Latter-day Saint faith, while they held on to the belief that polygamy is something as it was practiced in the Bible that was important. They said, it's against the law, and uh, we're not going to do it any longer. But groups, namely even groups uh, down in Colorado City, Hilldale, weren't accepting that, and they continued to say, no, the church, LDS church has gone astray. We're going to stick with the doctrine as God intended. Right. And so they continued to, to practice that and, and let it down that path. Yeah. And with all that rambling, I kind of forgot what the question was, Melissa. No, so. uh, just, just the number of polygamous groups in Utah. It, that there was oh, a lot. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there are a batch of them. And we had started a program in the Attorney General's office called Safe at Home. And we used that Safe at Home program as a way to go to the polygamous leaders in every community throughout the state and say, listen, we just want to instruct your people of what they can do if they're ever feeling threatened, if they're feeling, if they're being sexually abused. Because we heard the ghost stories, we knew the ghost stories, but it, those are such difficult cases to put together that we were only in isolated cases making a difference. And that would only lock down communities like yours, Sam, even more once you did that. And so uh, what we did is we approached folks like your father back then, Sam, and said, listen, as leaders of this community, do you have anything against us helping children understand that they don't need to be sexually abused? And of course, they would say, oh, we're 100% yeah. against that. And, uh, and then we would set up town halls where we'd come into town and we'd instruct. The downside of that was it was always a canned, prepared group of people who came in, accepted the instruction, said there's no problem, and then sent us on our way, and we were not able to get to the people that really needed to report things. And because of the control, as you've talked about on your show many times, and I think, Sam, we've even talked about individually, it was next to impossible for people to have a way to report out without being um, discovered from the internal mechanisms. Oh yes, very very difficult to <laughs> to especially for the women to to reach out in any way. And uh, so I wanted to kind of go back to the beginning of your FLDS experiences. And if do you remember the first time showing up to the Hilldale or Colorado City community? And if so, what was what was your first experience like? Well, the, the first time was a meeting in the mayor's office uh, in that little tan building uh, in Hilldale. I know, I know it well. I know it well. <laughs> yeah, just, just north of what now is uh, Willie Jessup's uh, Bandit Inn. Uh -huh. and, uh, <laughs> and there we met with city officials and uh, church leaders to talk, which is one and the same back in those days, oh, and yeah. uh, to talk about the concept and basically start this chess match of uh, this is really important information. There's no way you would tell us no is there. And, of course, them moving their chess piece saying, no, we're absolutely against anything abhorrent like that, and we'll make it available, and then setting up meetings. 
uh, as time unfolded, we started making appearances where we didn't uh, lay groundwork so that people were prepared. And uh, as upsetting as that was to many of the leaders in town, it was a way for us to start ingesting and kind of getting little burrs under the saddle of the organizational leadership in, in the community and let people know one-on-one that there were, um, there were avenues available to report if you needed to. From a legal standpoint, I mean, obviously the leaders of the church knew that there were underage marriages, right? And the people in the community knew that it was underage. Um, is that something that coming in, you kind of had to explain to them, like, this is also considered child abuse? Because sometimes I wonder, like, the yeah. young girls didn't, <laughs> it's hard to even explain to them that that is child abuse when that's what they grow up with, knowing that they could be married at 14 or 15 or 16 years old. So to even understand the basis of that's abuse, um, is that something that had to be, like, confronted with everyone? Or did they know and they were trying to find <laughs> that portion of it? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question, Melissa, because the challenge is there are so many ghost stories, but in order for law enforcement to do something with a ghost story, you have to have evidence, and that evidence can either be uh, a combination of different kinds. In, in When we talk evidence for investigations, there are kind of four primary kinds of evidence. There's physical and forensic evidence like a pregnancy or uh, a physical assault. There's uh, eyewitness testimony. I saw so-and-so uh, in an, a relationship with such and such a person. Uh, you have a confession, which you never were going to get in that <laughs> community, no. uh, where people say, yeah, I did it. Um, and, and then you have, uh, let's see, forensic uh Oh, and then you have the, this thing called circumstantial evidence, which is the A plus B always equals C kind of a thought of uh, this child uh, had a spiritual wedding to this adult and had a baby. And if we could have tested that baby and recovered DNA, we would be able to forensically tie them. Th those circumstantial cases become incredibly powerful. And when we look at criminal cases, you have to do it based on a combination, not just one thing. So somebody saying, I was uh, uh, given up as a child bride and I didn't want to do it, but I did it, is not as powerful as circumstantially tying a bunch of things together. Um, then what we did uh, later is we started adding behavioral evidence to help supplant uh, much of that. So it's really frustrating for the public because they hear a ghost story and they want immediate uh, damages assessed mm -hmm. and you can't do it. You got to follow the law. And even uh, saying that this child was given up in a, and in, in, I, I don't care what people say, a 14 year old <laughs> is still a child. In my opinion, this yeah, child given up in a spiritual wedding, there's not a physical document. There's a spiritual document, maybe even a notation if you could ever get to the uh, sacred records of yeah, the right. church. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's still a child. And unless you can forensically tie that child's baby, for instance, to an adult, then you, you, all you have are ghost stories. And yeah, there were I, a batch of ghost stories in yeah. Colorado City, Hilldale. <laughs> I can only imagine. I, I even knew some. So uh, another challenge you had, which uh, you can share your thoughts on this, was I don't know if you ever tried this or not, but to try to get someone undercover in the community would have been impossible, right? Is that something yeah. you tried to do? No, no, no chance at all. The, the best we had were people like uh, the Washington County Sheriff's Office deputies who were kind of accepted because they'd been there generationally. Uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a UPS driver, maybe, but uh, outside of that, uh, a visiting doctor coming in, then you, you had challenges of, it wasn't HIPAA back in those days, but still patient physician uh, protections. So, uh, and as you well know, you, you didn't move into that neighborhood and uh, 
plop up a, a new mailbox in front of your house <laughs> and have anyone come over with cookies. Oh, no. No, no, no. <laughs> not at all. It's Sorry, just a side funny story here. Uh, you mentioned the UPS drivers. Uh, believe it or not, even though we look at them as quote unquote bad people because they're wearing their their brown shorts and their brown t shirts. So they're showing way too much skin for our community. <laughs> way too much. <clears throat> However, those UPS drivers got some prayers sent their way. I don't know if they knew that or not, but uh, I heard several stories of young people in their prayers praying that the UPS driver doesn't fall out of his truck. <laughs> because the doors are always open. <laughs> oh, that's cute. <laughs> So anyway, it's yeah. a funny story about that. But you know, and, and let me let me just ask you. I mean, uh, I I am having flashbacks of driving through uh, town. Uh, if I pulled up alongside you as you were walking down the street, what would our conversation consist of? Uh, me running as fast as I can. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's like you talk about the ultimate boogeyman because he also represents a carnal world. Yep. Uh, it, it just isn't going to happen, in my opinion. Well, well, and we were afraid that anyone from the outside was not only mentally, but physically trying to hurt us. Uh, yeah. So if someone, if I was walking down the street and someone with short sleeves pulled up and tried to talk to me, I would assume that they were trying to hurt me in some way, just be based on what I'd been told growing up. And so, the raids, the previous raids, and, and the raids were it, talked about a lot. Yeah, yeah. Or that they were trying to take me away from my family or something. So, yeah, I can only imagine the, the difficult task you were you were up against there. Um, do you, did, at some point, did you start making headway somehow? Like, what, what did it kind of all turn into for you? Uh, no, not during not during my years <clears throat> was there much headway. There there was relationships that were created that were um, again uh, controversial relationships. I mean, uh, I I uh, tried to get into uh, meet with the prophet on many occasions. I had folks like Willie Jessup who was a uh, a rival. We we uh, didn't like each other. We had to play fairly in the sandbox together because we knew that uh, it could politically look bad for either one of us. And, uh, and when I finally uh, went and met with Willie a few months ago, uh, when, when he picked up the phone, I mean, it was still, you could tell we did not like each other. And uh, we ended up spending eight hours together uh, that day and really talked through a bunch of the ghost stories and Willie shared an incredible amount, maybe part in part because of his own redemptive process to whatever level people might believe that's happening um, to, to try to clean the slate because he was duped as, as many of you were. Oh, yes. And, uh, but, but as far as saying, did we make progress no, we accomplished goals like getting safe at home programs introduced into the community, getting chances to talk to select groups that would show up. But um, to use a term that you might be very familiar with down there, an old farming term I learned from my grandfather, we weren't getting the water to the end of the row to oh, the yes. people that needed it. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, very, very familiar. So, with how that. many how many years did that go on, or how long were you involved with it, or where did it take a turn to where um, between then and when Warren Jeffs there was something that you guys could use to be able to try to go after him? So, uh, there were a number of um, uh, polygamous communities that I was working with with allegations of sexual abuse of children that uh, took us throughout the state. Uh, some of those touched into the FLDS community, but it, uh, and I worked the uh, FLDS community off and on through 2004, so almost 14 years when I finally retired. And it was shortly after that, of course, that, um, that uh, um, Warren was arrested. Uh, okay. many, again, many of the things that happened, uh, I learned just like you did watching the news uh, as it unfolded. So what I had is more historical knowledge than knowledge of the day he was arrested. I remember taking Willie, though, over to the church 
and walking it through the entire process the day Warren escaped federal custody when the raid occurred on the church during that church meeting that Sunday morning and uh, and where how Willie uh, drove the prophet through a barricade and down into the river bottoms and and of course uh, for for him it was a very uh, heroic and historic moment and uh, but it was interesting to walk through and, and understand many of the things that were happening there. Uh, I spent a lot of time, frankly, looking at things like the children's cemetery because of uh, ghost stories surrounding children who were uh, born and buried without benefit of getting a death certificate or a birth certificate and uh, things like that that uh, happened during my period. So kind of look at what I was doing as a time of laying the groundwork. And uh, we were actually changing the way that investigators were thinking of these kinds of crimes. So again, if you go back to the nineties and the satanic panic and the formation of the ritual crimes against children task force, what we did after investigating about 300 of these kinds of cases is we came to the determination that law enforcement needs to quit thinking about the voodoo of religion and focus on the thing that they're good at, which is the elements of crime, of what crime. it takes for a child abuse, what it takes for a rape of a child, and create criminal cases around that. And then you can in, in, introduce all the wacky uh, theology later down the road during a sentencing hearing, but don't, don't make this an issue about freedom of religion or anything else. Make it about what we know which is violating of criminal law. Exactly. Yeah. When you're talking about um, being walked through the day that um, Willie Jessup got uh, Warren Jess out of that church, were you there when they went into the chapel? No. Okay. Because okay, Sam, so, Sam was there, and I couldn't remember, remember that, I yes. couldn't remember if you'd been there or if Willie had walked you through that process later, but... Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, no. We walked through you. just a few, just a few months ago. Actually, is when we walked around and talked, and and uh, we, 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 yeah, like I said, we spent eight hours together that day, kind of going to all these secret places. Some of which I'm going to talk to Sam about and ask questions about. But tell me what that was like that day, Sam, because uh, I'll tell you from uh, the failure of law enforcement's perspective. Uh, Willie and the security team that he had actually defeated law enforcement in their strategy to get Warren based yeah. on using the very tactics that they were using against them, which was really quite, uh, I got to, got to applaud the guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it's something, I mean, I was a young boy at this time and uh, it was very frightening for me. Uh, we kind of knew that people were after Warren at this point and, and uh, so we were kind of all on high alert, but yeah, it was it was just a month. Sun, or a, yeah, I believe it, I didn't know if it was Saturday or Sunday. It was one. It was a. It was one of those meetings in the morning. I thought it was a Saturday morning meeting, but anyway, we were. You, just, you probably right. Yeah. Yeah, uh, because generally on Sundays were afternoon meetings until those came to a stop. So I believe it was a Saturday morning, and just it was a normal meeting. We were all sitting. You know, the meeting was about to begin. We sang a song and then the person was saying a prayer and we all bowed our head and closed our eyes. And I, I heard some rustling at the, at, the, at the front door. I heard that someone was trying to get in and then kind of some shouting and some stuff, commotion going on over there. And we had, uh, had bodyguards uh, at the doors. I don't I, I believe they even carried weapons, but we had some some man there and. So I hear that, I look up, and by the time I look up, all of the leaders sitting on the stand were gone. They had just, they had just run out the door. And, of course, like you said, they escaped. And, and you also mentioned that uh, Willie thought it was a heroic moment. For us, it was very, very um, faith-building that, yeah. that, he, that, he, that Warren Jeffs was a true prophet and that things were not going to be turned over to the authorities because God would always protect him from the authorities. That was kind of the way we looked at it. So you can imagine when Warren Jeffs actually got caught, it was, it was like a slap in the face. I, I thought he would never get caught because he was, I, I assumed he would always be protected. But anyway, but yeah, it was, a, it was quite the, the crazy experience. 
was that the, was it the FBI or was it someone else that, that came that day? There, there were a, there were a host of federal agents, including marshal okay. service. Yeah. Okay, I wasn't sure who it was, but I I just knew that that uh, he got away and and somehow escaped law enforcement. So yeah, and isn't that interesting how these uh, leaders take any kind of a situation and they'll either put the failures on the backs of the members for not being faithful enough yep. or they'll put the escape on to further enhance that God is a hundred percent behind this person <laughs> and led them through uh, their own uh, red sea. You know, it, yeah. it just is incredible to me, but boy, oh boy, when there's failures, you <laughs> poor people that didn't pray hard enough are all responsible. Didn't pray hard enough or just aren't worthy, aren't good enough, aren't prepared for, for, for God to protect you or to help the leaders or whatever. So it's always, it's very easy to blame the members. You're correct. You're correct. Yeah. And that's the kind of rhetoric that even still now, even the revelations that have come out this year from Warren um, in prison. And um, we had a member who just recently left that sent us all the most recent ones. So we have like these original copies and it's still the same rhetoric of, you know, okay, you guys have all been being wicked. And so now you have to be better and better and better. And the rules are getting just more and more and more intense. And right when you think that it can't get any more intense, you're like, how do, how do you even control them anymore? Like you're controlling what they eat, what they can and cannot, I mean, down to like whether or not they can drink milk and like oh, yeah. normal foods and onions and just down to the tiniest, tiniest thing. And then they still find ways to try to, get even more control to blame them for, you know, Warren just still not being released from prison. Yeah, they're still blaming the members that Warren hasn't been released yet. And it's still being prophesied that he will, that he will be released soon. Oh, yeah. And only the most faithful members will know where he is, yeah. was in one of the recent ones. And yeah. so it just continues. A lot of, a lot of crazy on. stuff coming up for sure. So we're just hoping that we can uh, share this information and help anyone that, that hears it. Yeah.